All right, Psalm 116, verses 1 and 2. All right, let's read our text and then give you the title and have a word of prayer and ask God to bless this. Uh, Psalm 116, verse 1 and 2, the Bible says, I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications, because he hath inclined his ear unto me. Therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. Again, verse 1 says, I love the Lord. Out of these verses, I want to give you the sermon title. I want to give you also three reasons why we should love the Lord. Three reasons why I love the Lord from this verse, uh, this morning, these two verses. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, well, I love you. We love you. I, at least I hope everyone loves you. Uh, I pray you'd uh, increase our love for God this morning. Help us to view you properly and what you do in the, on the behalf of men. And I pray we uh, have a fresh taste of heaven, a, a great perspective of what you do, and help us to love you with a pure heart. We, lo- we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We must love the Lord the way this verse explains. Why do you love the Lord? Do you love the Lord? Let me give you five, 55 reasons why I love the Lord. I, I might not give all 55. He first loved me. He sent his only begotten son to die in my place. He forgives all my sin. He's my strength. He supplies all my need. He's my protector. He's my shepherd. He convicts me and chastens me. He gives me eternal life. He speaks to me through his word. He satisfies my every longing. He's my deliverer. He hears and answers prayer. He's given me a godly wife and godly children that, that, that want to that be in church. He's blessed me uh, materially and, not, and has gone way above my physical needs. I'm privileged to hear good Bible preaching uh, when he speaks through me and when I hear others preach uh, God's mighty word. I'm blessed with godly friends and a godly church. He is almighty God. He's Emmanuel. He's God with us. He's no respecter of persons. He is holy. He left all the riches of heaven and humbled himself, came to earth as a man and became a servant and was obedient unto the death of the cross. He is the way, the only way to heaven. He keeps me from falling into sin. He will present me faultless before uh, his presence. He calls me his friend. He's all that I need. He loads me daily with benefits, the Bible says in Psalms. And, and uh, this, uh, actually, it was not 55. It was 64 reasons I've listened. I didn't give you all of them. But he is my supreme example in manifesting the fruits of the Spirit. Love for God. Do you love God? We all, say, we all would say we love God. You know, there's, there's a, a guy in 1500-something said this, My God, I love thee, not because I hope for heaven thereby, nor yet because we love thee not, are, are lost eternally. Thou, O oh my Jesus, thou didst me upon the cross embrace, for me didst bear the nails and spear and manifold disgrace, and griefs and torments numberless, and sweat of agony. Yea, death itself, and all for me, who was thine enemy. Then why, O oh blessed Jesus Christ, should I not love thee well, not for sake of winning heaven, nor of escaping hell, not from hope of gaining aught, not seeking a reward, but as thyself has loved me, O ever-loving Lord, so would I love thee, dearest Lord, and in thy praise will sing, solely because thou art my God and my most loving King. I love God because he loved me long before the world began. I love God because he knew my destiny. I love God because he made me part of his eternal plan. I love God because he first loved me. I love him for all the things he's done for me. I love him for all that he is and all that he is to me. But most of all, I love him as the spirit who deep within me lives. I love the Lord. I love the Lord. Right here in our verse, it's a blessed declaration. Every believer ought to be able to declare without the slightest hesitation, I love the Lord. It was required under the law, but was never produced in the heart of man except by the grace of God and upon gospel principles. It is the great thing to say, I love the Lord. For the sweetest of all graces is the shortest of all evidences of salvation is love. It's the greatest thing you can tell to your child. It's the greatest thing your child can say to you. When they start begin to speak and they say, I love you, Daddy, there's nothing, there's nothing, there's nothing comparable on this earth that a little boy or a little girl, your, your boy, your girl, that looks up to you when they learn to talk and they learn to say, I love you. You know, before they talk, it's usually by a kiss or a hug or an embrace, you know, is how they communicate love. But when they can verbalize it, it's all the more sweeter. I love the Lord as Messiah, David's antitype, did, of which he gave the fullest proof by his obedience to his will. And as, a David, and as David, the man after God's own heart, did, and as every good man does, the Lord is to be loved for the perfections of his nature and especially as they are displayed in Christ and salvation by him, and for his works of creation, providence, and grace, and particularly for his great love shown in redemption, regeneration, and other blessings of grace, 
as well as for what follows. I love you, Lord, and I'll lift my voice to worship you. O oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my king, in what you hear. Let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. I love you, Lord. I love him again because he first loved me, 1 John 4, 19. When I pray in God's will, I have what I desire, Mark eleven twenty four. He made me a suitable helper for me uh, in, in Elizabeth Wilt, Genesis two eighteen. I have no need to worry about food, Matthew 6, 26. He has plans for me and a will for my life, Jeremiah 29, 11, and is deeply interested in my life. Before I was born, he had a purpose in mind for me, Ephesians 2, 10. He's preparing a better place for me, John 14, 3. No more tears, no more crime, no more injustice or pain. When Jesus comes for me, he's taken me to a gated community where I will find love, fun, and a never-ending feast by his side. Nothing in this world can compare to that place. I love him because he listens when I speak, Psalm 66. He is the one friend, the one father, the one comforter, comforter who truly listens when I speak. I can count on him in times of trouble, Psalm 46.1. In hard times, I can come to God in prayer, and he provides for me. After all, I love him because, he, because despite my sin... Christ died for me, Romans 5, 8. Number one from our verse, I love, love the Lord, just what the Bible says here, because he hath heard my voice and my supplications. Number one, I love God. Three reasons why I love God. Now, I love God because he hears me. Because he hears me. Now, I know that's, re that's really simple. That may, be, that may not blow in your mind this morning, but he hears me. Time how short, eternity how long, death how brief, immortally how endless, Oh, the transporting rapturous scene that God can hear my voice, that he listens to me. Of all the billions of people, of all the people that are doing things that you think that are maybe higher prayers than your own, when you seek him out in prayer and desire him to hear you, he does. He listens to you. He hears prayer. We're not praying to an idol or a statue or a piece of cement or a piece of precious metal or, or of any kinds of wood. We're praying to the God who hears, the real God in heaven. God hears my prayer. Sweet fields array in living green and rivers of delight. Fill with delight my raptured soul where, uh, who uh, would here no longer stay. Through Jordan's waves around me roll, fearless I'd launch away. Spurgeon said, yet nevertheless, the Christian may do well sometimes to look backward. He may look back to the hole of the pit and the miry clay whence he was digged. The retrospect will help him to be humble and will urge him to be faithful. He may look back with satisfaction to the glorious hour when he first saw the Lord. When spiritual life for the first time quickened his dead soul, then he may look back through all the change of his life, to his troubles, his joys, to his uh, uh, highs and lows, to the land of, the, uh, to the land of the victory, to the land of defeat. He must not keep his eye always backward, for the fairest scene dies beyond. It will not benefit him to always consider the past, for the future is far more glorious. But nevertheless, at times, a retrospect may be useful as a prospect. A memory may be as good teacher as even faith itself. This morning I bid you to stand up on the hilltop of the present experience and look back on the past and find therein motives for love to God. That may the Holy Spirit so help me in preaching to you, this is Spurgeon saying this, in hearing that your love may be inflamed and that you may retire from this hall declaring in the language of the psalmist, I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplication. I love the Lord. Why? Because he heard my voice. He heard my voice. Now, if you look at verse 1 again, what voice is he hearing? Because he hath heard my voice. My voice. He's a loving father. He cares. You could say, Dad, I need you. And he hears your voice. Hey, there's a lot of earthly parents that maybe don't have time for their kids. There's a lot of kids that maybe don't have time for their parents. There's a lot of relationships that are strained. That we, we live in a world that has strained relationships. When we say, Dad, I need you. I need you to work on behalf of this. I need you to heal me. I need you to deliver me. I need you to get me through this situation. God hears you. He cares about you. It's your voice. Yes, it's, it's King David. Yes, it's the man after God's own heart. Yes, it's the beloved. Yes, it's David speaking. But we can put our name right here. God hears John's voice. God hears Tanisha's voice. God hears Francine's voice. God hears Deborah's voice. God hears Josh's voice. God hears Ricardo's voice. When you're going through something and you speak out to God, you cry out to God, God hears your voice. The Bible says, I the Lord because he had heard my voice. Hey, we could almost expect, yeah, God will hear Spurgeon's voice. God will hear the TV preacher's voice. Maybe, you know, God will hear, uh, you know, prominent uh, Christian figures, you know. He'll hear their voice. But God hears my voice. 
He hears my voice. And guess what? It says, he hath heard my voice. There may be some people that think that you don't have anything important to say or that you are asking too much or asking too often. Or you may, there may be others that really don't care about what you have to say or don't even want to listen to you. But God wants to listen to you. I mean, it's just, it's just mind-blowing that he cares about what you're going through. There may be, you may feel like nobody cares, but God does. He hears your voice. He said, hey, that's Tanisha. Hey, that's Alex. I hear Alex calling out to me. I hear what he's saying. I, I'm inclined to him. I, I want to hear his voice. I'm hearing this. The source, he, the sense, hath heard, the sense of hearing. You know, we don't have a dead God with no hearing, no seeing, no helping. We don't serve a lifeless statue that can't see or hear. We don't worship a block of cement. We worship the God who's living, who's seated on the right hand of God. We, we serve God the Father sitting on the throne. My God can hear me. My God can see me. Statues are a, a horrible example of what God is truly like. That's a chunk of cement. That's a chunk of wood. It can't do nothing for you. You can cut yourself. You can put fruits and vegetables before its feet. You can weep at it and, and kiss the statue's feet, but it won't do nothing for you. It can't hear. But guess what? My God can hear. My God's living. My God's not a statue. Let's also look at the specific. God, uh, because he hath heard my voice. He hears my voice. Sometimes we can't even get out the prayer. You know, sometimes it's a groaning. Sometimes it's just a, it's, it's a silence. But God hears me. And really, you know, is it that God, is, God needs to, uh, God can only work when he audibly hears your voice? You know, God even knows what you need before you even say it. God knows what you're about to say. You know, but we, have to, we have to verbalize. We have to see God working on our behalf. God knows what our heart is saying before our words can, can put it together. Even if we mess up our words. God knows what we're saying. God knows what we want. God wants to hear our voice the very specificness of my voice. And then that supplication. You know what supplication means? It's an old you know, kind of King James word or an old word we don't use as often. It literally means the request. God hears our request. You know, uh, what is it? Moody used to say prayer is just asking and receiving. Now, sometimes we think, well, I may be just asking too much. God says, hey, I'm your dad. I want to hear it. Just ask me. I want to hear that request. I want to hear that list. I want to hear what you need. I want you to serve me. I want you to be uplifted that I'll answer prayer. I want you to do something, you know. Uh, it, it's interesting that uh, as, as I was finishing the 11th page, I have 11 pages of notes this morning. I, I had those 55 reasons I love the Lord. That took up two pages. But, uh, so, so technically like eight or 10 or whatever, whatever, uh, nine. <laughs> uh, so uh, as I was finishing the 11th page, my computer glitched out. And, uh, and, and, and I couldn't see anything on the screen. It was, it was giving me three pages of blank in Microsoft Word. I don't know what it is about computers and printers and all that I have trouble with, but I, I finished it out. It was late uh, Saturday night. We got in from our trip. I had to kind of finalize some things, and it went black, uh, blank, and, and, and it, did, it did at one point go black, and I was like, well, and I noticed up in the corner that autosave was off, and I was like, well, I mean, I'll turn off my computer, turn it back on, and hopefully I got 11 pages, and I was like, but I paused before that, and I prayed, and I was like, God, I guess you're teaching me even in this moment to trust you by prayer. It was just, it was 11 pages that I have this morning. Obviously, you see how God answered, but, um, you know, I didn't know what God was going to do. I was like, well, I'll either preach something else, maybe God was going to preach something else, or I'll just uh, uh, work on it again and just put another, you know, however many hours I could get into it, and, and then God just made it come back. It, it did auto-save, even though it said auto-save was off. So just God is amazing. God hears our voice, even the smallest thing, sermon preparation, at the job, at work, in your house, with your kids with your health concerns, with, with situations, uh, big decisions in your life, no matter how big, how small, broken fingernail, uh, you know, stubbed toe, God cares. God wants to work on your behalf. God wants to encourage you. You know why? Because God then can do bigger things later. You know, how, how could we trust God for a building like this? Because we trusted God for the first building. We trusted God to move here. We trusted God to give us the living room, and then the first storefront, and then, then the second storefront. And I remember I was just talking to Dad over the weekend and why I was here for Fleet Week, and he's like, well, you know, you're, you're on course to outgrow this building, you know? But, you know, we could see it. You know, we could see God giving us a building that costs 5000 or 6000 rent. God could do it. God, God's brought us, you know, we've trusted God in the living room, and the trust has never changed. But when we seek God in prayer, he hears me. It just, it just he hears my request. It's just an amazing thing. And God heard the voice of the lad in Genesis 21. When no one heard the voice of the lad, when, when he was just crying behind a bush, God heard the voice of that little boy.
praise the Lord. Exodus 3, 7, And the Lord said, I have certainly seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Hey, it could get really bad in America. You know, we think it's bad, but it's just because it doesn't go our political way at times. Uh, then it switches, you know, and we get happy. But you know, it, could get, it could get really bad. It could become persecution of types. And God knows our affliction. God would know our affliction if we had to go underground, if we had to fear arrest or imprisonment or physical danger. God knows the afflictions of his people. He heard them in Egypt. He heard when they were slaves. And God said, I know, I know your situation. I'm going to bring you out of that. You're going to be my people. God knows his people. Exodus 22, 30, 23. If thou afflict them in any wise, and they cry out to me uh, at, at all unto me, I will surely hear their cry. God says that to every government. Hey, if, if my people are oppressed and they call out to me, I will hear them, and I will act on their behalf. I'll answer their prayer. You better watch out. Anybody that touches my child. Hey, what would happen if God touched my children? What would happen if someone tried to enter my home? Now, I'm not the biggest or strongest guy, but I would do all that is in me with every breath and every uh, fiber and muscle that I have to defend my family. Oh, what could God do? Oh, God says, I see them. I heard their affliction. If anybody afflicts them in any way and they cry out to me at all, I will surely hear their cry and, and, and argument and, and work on their behalf. Psalm 50, 15, and call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Psalm 65, 2, O thou that hearest prayer, the psalmist says, unto thee shall all flesh come. Psalm 91, 15, he shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. God hears you. God wants to hear you. The, the greater thing about that is not the fact that he does hear us, but he wants to hear you. Maybe you're not speaking as often as you should. God can hear you. God is waiting to hear you. God hears you. Number one, I love God because he hears me. Number two, verse two, I love God uh, because he helps me. Because he helps me. Look at verse two. We saw because he hath heard my voice. Look at verse two. Because he hath inclined his ear unto me. What was that? What was that? All right. <laughs> Sometimes I do that. I can't, maybe I can't hear it very well because of being a drummer. But you know, what did you say? He inclined his ear. He's like, what, what is that? You know, okay, yeah, I got that. No, not that he has to do that. He can hear no matter if he leans down or not. But the, the word imagery help us to, helps us to understand he inclines to us. You know, maybe as, as, a, as a king sitting on a throne, then has a subject come in and he inclines down and, and directs his full attention to that. You know, being uh, hyperactive uh, as I am, and many of you know, uh, it's, it's sometimes hard for me to do that, you know, to, to focus right on one person. You know, I focus on every person. You know, that's just the way I'm, I'm wired, and, and I really have to take great care to focus on that person. God does that. He can hear everyone, but then when you call out, he then inclines to you. He kind of looks toward your direction, you know, so to speak, and inclines to you. He leans to you. He focuses on you. He hears me. He helps me. We naturally incline the ear toward anyone we wish to hear distinctly what he says, and we turn away the ear when we do not. We've all seen people ignore, but God doesn't do that. He inclines us. He turns to us. Because he has inclined his ear unto me, not as, uh, as hard of hearing, for his ear is not heavy that he cannot hear, or as, uh, he is quick of hearing. His ears are always open to the righteous. It rather denotes his readiness to hear. He hearkens and hears. You know, rather, you know, so much stuff that he's like, what'd you say? But, but, but he's ready. Well, what'd you say? All right, let's, let's do it. You know, he's ready to hear. He hearkens and hears. He listens to what people say. He hears them at once. He understands them. Though ever so broken and confused when their prayers are but like the chatterings of a crane or a swallow or only expressed in sighs and groans or even without a voice. When nothing is articulated, pronounced uh, perfectly, moreover, this shows condescension in him. He bows his ear as a rattler to a child. He stoops as being above them and inclines his ear to them. How beautiful is that idea that he helps me. He inclines his ear to me. But why don't I pray? Why aren't I praying? Why am I so silent when God wants to hear me, can work on my behalf, and wants to help me, and I keep my mouth shut? Why do I do that? I must be the most foolish person on the planet, and you would be too if you do that. I imagine God inclining his ear to me, bringing it so close to my mouth that I can whisper what I can't say out loud. Help me, Lord. Help me. God has heard my supplications, my pleas for assistance, direction, and relief. He has heard my rambling thoughts, my half-baked intentions. He holds my sighs and groans, my laughter, my despair. He listens to it all and leans closer still. Hey, I've got some half-baked ideas. 
I, I, I have a little bit of what God's revealed to me. Sometimes I get just a, a small vision of the direction to go for God. And, and I may have it all put together, but I just go for God. And God hears all those half-baked ideas and plans and, and visions. And we just throw Fleet Week to Sunday together uh, for last week. And God blesses abundantly. You know, how does God do that? Because he cares. He wants to help. He wants to help us out. He wants to hear. He's inclined his ear to me to listen to another soul into a condition of disclosure and discovery may be almost the greatest service that any human being performs for another. Doug Steer wrote that on his listening to another. Come, God says, let me wipe your tears and let my mouth come close to your ear and say to you, I love you, I love you, I love you, I want to help you. Hey, I love the Lord because he hears me and because he helps me. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 32, 8, with him is an arm of flesh, but with us, is the Lord, our God, to help us and to fight our battles. And, to, and the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. What, what made King Hezekiah so good? He said, God fights our battles. You might think I'm a military genius. We're winning battles, but it's not me. It's God fighting our battles. Why do you fight your own battles? Why do you fight against uh, these, these conflicts? And you think, I can just fight this. I can get this. But you don't let God fight it for you. Isaiah 41, 10, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Acts 18, 10, for I am with thee. And no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. 2 Timothy 4, 17, Notwithstanding the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. 2 Timothy 4, 22, The Lord Jesus Christ be with you, uh, uh, be with thy spirit, grace be with you. Amen. I love the Lord because he hears me. I love the Lord because he helps me. Number thir uh, Thirdly and lastly, number three, I love the Lord because he is worthy of lifelong commitment. Look at verse two again. Because he hath inclined his ear unto me. Therefore, in conclusion, I'm drawing a great conclusion to the holy book of understanding of why we love the Lord. Therefore, will I call upon him as long as I live. Have you lost hope in prayer? Have, has your Christian life gone silent? Maybe you read the Bible. Maybe you understand spiritual truth. Maybe you're somewhat faithful in church and you hear God's word, but you're not speaking out to him in prayer. Have you lost your prayer life? Has it gone silent? Does, does God hear from your location? Does he hear anything from you from a day, from a week? Maybe, maybe, maybe he hears once a week or once a month. What's your prayer life like? It's worthy of lifelong commitment. If God hears me and helps me and is working on my behalf, why aren't I praying? Why am I not praying? I gave the story many times where I was in Manhattan, and uh, it was something political. And I said, well, I, th I believe we need to pray to God for this situation. And they said, oh, what could prayer do? You know, the world has, has, a, has a low view on prayer. What's talking to a God in heaven? What could that do? I could show you things around this building of what it could do. I could show you lives in this building of what God can do. I could show you people in this community that used to go here that were doing good. You know, maybe not so good anymore, but you know, they need to be back in this building. But I could, see, I could show you people that have been changed. I could show you what God does. I could show you what, what prayer does. When we pray for Bible time, it brings us Catherines and all kinds of people in our church. And when we bring youth groups in, it brings us Beverly's back in the day. And, and when we do youth rallies, it brings us Isabel's and Tanisha's. Boy, it can do amazing things. And, and you know, Bible time brought John and June and their whole family. As we walked up and invited them to, to different things we do, what could God do? Yes, yeah, just, just a, a thing we do around here, but God works on behalf of prayer. When we ask, God, give us a family. Remember, remember when we started Bible time, God, give us one family? That's how we used to pray. Just God, give us, add to the church one family. And then I think, I think it was even Nilda that said, we should uh, not stop at one, let's pray. And then the next day I think we prayed for three families. And so, you know, we just kept increasing. Maybe this year we'll pray for five families. You know, boy, it's just amazing. It's, he's worthy of lifelong commitment. I'm resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have a Lord my sight. I will hasten, hasten to him. Hasten so glad and free. Go quickly. It's an old hymn there. Jesus greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I've decided to follow Jesus. I've decided to follow Jesus. I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on Canaan's table land. 
a higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. The Bible says, in reference to prayer and seeking God, let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace, boldly knowing that God hears and helps and answers prayer, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Are you in need this morning? I think we'd all say we love the Lord, but do you love the Lord for these reasons? Very elementary reasons, but maybe your prayer life has gone cold. Maybe you stopped talking. Maybe you've gone to the, the short talking. Maybe you just like, throw just a couple sentences to God and, and call that a prayer. Well, the, the, the hymn writer says, sweet hour of prayer. Have you prayed for hours before? Maybe you're, maybe you're at the short prayer right now. Maybe that's where God's grown you. You are praying maybe now, and maybe there are five, ten-minute prayers. Why don't you push for an hour, half an hour, 45 minutes? Well, I'll lose time. I'll, I'll get less done. Uh, the old preachers of the past, all of them used to say, I, would, I, I need to invest the time in prayer. I need to take the time for prayer. I can't start my day without a long time in prayer. The old guys, the old dead guys had something going on. They understood the power of prayer. Yet in our modern, quick culture, we think, ah, oh, five minutes will get me through the day. That five-minute thing, hey, I prayed. I, I threw a couple sentences this way. Boy, I don't know. There's nothing more, more spiritual about long prayers. You know, Pharisees did pray to be seen of men. But you know what? You know, God wants to grow us even in the area of prayer. So it's not that God wants to hear much speaking. We don't want to just add a bunch of lords and Jesus and, and, and you know, all those little filler words. But we want to genuinely talk to God and it be, to be conversation. I love the Lord because he hears me, he helps me, and he's worthy of lifelong commitment in the area of prayer in our context. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, would you help us uh, to understand these principles? Lord, we need our prayer lives to be on fire for you. Lord, what prayer could do for this church? What prayer has done for this church? Lord, what prayer could do for the church's future? We need to pray as a collective whole, unity in prayer, unity in vision, as to what you could do in this place. Lord, there's people still to reach. There's more Dave Wilts and Johns and Catherines and Beverly's and Tanisha's and Isabel's. There's all kind of people that need the Lord, that need you to work on their behalf. They need to grow in the Lord. Lord, we need growth. We need maturity. We need discipleship. We need evangelism. Lord, we need, uh, we need people to, to give of their tithes and offerings so we can do more. Uh, those that attend and not that we're... Uh, Lord, we just need you. We need you to work on behalf of our church. We need all these things. We need you, Lord. We need you to be in this place. We need you to be lifted up. If, you, if you're lifted up, you'll draw all men to yourself. Lord, help us to, for every big Sunday to lift you up. May you be lifted up. May, may we not lift up a program, but lift you up. Lord, we need you. Lord, we need you to work on behalf of people that are leaving. We think of Alex and Katie leaving, going to Florida. We need them to be a light in that place, to be serving you down there in Florida or wherever you take them uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the uh, Border Patrol. And, Lord, we need you to work on behalf of other families. Hey, there's still, there's still hundreds of Coast Guard families, several people on base that need the Lord, that need you in their life. There's people that are steeped in false religion. People need the Lord. We need you, Lord. We need you to be in this place. We need to be unified in a desire to see you work on behalf of people. There are people that are so cold this morning, so far away from God, that, that, that don't talk to you, that don't read your word. I pray you'd help them to get right with you this morning. There's teenagers that may be struggling with pornography. There's, there's marriages that are on the rocks because of looking for lust in other places and desires and fulfillment and other people other than their spouse. There's single moms that are ripping their hair out that need you to work on their behalf to help them raise their, their, their kids to be godly. There's families that need to be in church with their kids. There's people that need their marriages restored. There's, there's abuse, Lord, that needs to be taken care of, verbal, physical, and, we, and sadly, there could be sexual abuse. I don't know, Lord, but we need you to protect and help and heal and, and, and work on behalf of these people, Lord. There's people that need you. We need you, Lord. Would you heal sickness? Would you heal marriages and heal uh, relationships among our uh, parents and kids? There's teenagers that need you, Lord. They need to be a witness for you in their public school and in their Christian schools and in our society and community. People need the Lord. We, we need you, Lord. We need you to hear us. We need you to help us. For we need to be committed to you for a lifelong. With every head bowed and every eye closed.
who would say, God's convicted me about my prayer life in some kind of way through the message. God spoke to me that I need to change some things in my life in reference to prayer and how I say I love God and need to respond back to prayer as we learned in our context. Anybody like that? Just heads about eyes are closed. God spoke to me about prayer. I need to change some things. I see that hand. You can put your hands down. Nobody looking around, just me, so I can pray for you. So you can put your hands down. Thank you. Who would say, I, I used to be faithful in praying for this person or, or, or this thing, and I've, I've gotten away from praying more faithfully. I need to start praying for this. You have not because you ask not, the Bible says. So maybe you've lost your faithfulness in prayer. Maybe you used to always pray for this thing or this person or this situation, and you stopped praying faithfully. It's easy to complain about things. It's a whole other thing to pray for that. Maybe you want something even about America, about the president, the leadership, and congressmen and women. You have not because you ask not. Maybe we have some of the things we have politically uh, in certain places because we're not praying for that person to be saved or for them to change. We have not because we ask not. So maybe there's some that would say, yeah, that's me, Pastor. I'm raising my hand because there, there's something I used to pray for, or there's something I should be praying for that God's shown me that I need to do that. Anybody like that? You've stopped praying for something you need to start praying for again. I see that hand. Anybody else? I see that hand. I see that hand. Something you need to pray for. I see that hand. You can put it down. Maybe it's someone to be saved or situation, whatever it could be. Heavenly Father, we thank you for each and every person. I pray that this commitment would not be an emotional workup or just an in-the-moment thing, but a remembered, permanent change of life, that we would leave here, remember our commitment to prayer, and never give up, because the Bible says that he's worthy. He's worthy. Therefore, will I call upon him as long as I live, till I take my last breath, I ought to be calling upon him, calling upon him, crying out to him, calling upon him. Lord, we thank you for it. Help us to remember our decision. In Jesus' name, amen.